Peter is used to uh, to covering big stories, and time and again he's done he's done so with exceptional skill and grace. Um, Obama is actually the third president that Peter has covered. He started with Clinton, and then did a stint in Putin's Russia as Moscow bureau chief, and he also spent some time reporting on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. He resumed his coverage of the White House with Bush's second term and is still going strong there. Uh, he's also written a couple of very good books before uh, this most recent one. His volume on the impeachment and trial of Clinton, titled The Breach, was a bestseller. And his book on Russia, Kremlin Rising, which he co-wrote co with his wife, Susan Glasser, won critical acclaim. Uh, I first met Peter at the Washington Post, where he worked for 20 years before moving to the New York Times five years ago. And I've always been amazed at how a guy who looks so youthful and boyish uh, can report with such insight and authority. Uh, he has a reputation for being not only an incisive reporter and very smooth writer, but also an exceptionally fair journalist. So it's no surprise that his new book, Days of Fire, about the complicated White House relationship between Bush and Cheney has received much praise for being a thorough, revealing page turner. Even given all that's already been written about the troubled Bush presidency, Peter has managed to come up with uh, fresh material and clarifying accounts. Now I also know something about the Bush administration, having reported on the Pentagon for the Post during that time, and at the end, I wrote a biography of Donald Rumsfeld. So I can vouch that Peter's book definitely advances our view of the Bush years. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you read his book instead of mine, <laughs> but you should definitely read at least both. As Jim, Cu Jim Kelly wrote in the New York Times review of Peter's book, Days of Fire is the most reliable, comprehensive history of the Bush years yet. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Peter Baker. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, very gracious introduction. You know, it reminds me of something that uh, Vice President Cheney actually would say uh, whenever he would go out and give speeches in 2008. He would, uh, he would get a very nice, gracious uh, introduction, uh, very nice applause, and he would say, that makes me almost want to run for office again. And then he would stress, almost. <laughs> and I feel that way about book writing right now. That makes me almost want to write another book. <laughs> almost. <laughs> um, I'm really thrilled to be here tonight because um, as a hometown boy, uh, no one knows better than I do how important politics and prose is to our community, to, our, uh, to all the people here who care about books, who care about long form journalism, who care about history. Uh, and it's become such an institution uh, over the years and has grown only more so under Brad and Lissa's uh, 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 tenure. It's been a fantastic transition, fun to watch as friends as, and, as, and as loyal customers. So I think uh, we all ought to give Brad and Lissa a little bit of a hand. And I, Brad and I, he was right, I work with both Brad and Lissa at the Washington Post, which is a great privilege. Um, Brad's book actually is phenomenally great about Donald Rumsfeld. Anybody who's interested in Rumsfeld actually should read this book, not instead of. <laughs> uh, but it, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is something, it is a, uh, something that I aspire to with mine, which is scrupulously fair, smart, insightful, uh, but doesn't, uh, doesn't give a pass on anything. It, 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 uh, the, the words that David Frum used in an interview that I liked a lot was it neither accuses nor excuses. I think that uh, uh, was characteristic of Brad's tenure at the Post, characteristic of his book, uh, and, and what a lot of us, uh, including myself, aspire to when we write ours. So uh, having Brad introduce you is, is, uh, uh, is, a, little, uh, is a little daunting and, a little, and, and very um, gratifying. Um, I, I want to. I, I see some friends in the audience tonight. I don't want to single out too many people, but thank you everybody for coming. Uh, it's a great treat to see you. Uh, I do have three little boys in particular. I do want to thank. Over here we have Max and Marshall. Wait, boys, there we go. And right here, little Theo, who's in the book and uh, is dedicated to him. Uh, he gave me one piece of advice when I wrote it. He said, "Dad, make it compelling." <laughs> 
So I have I strive for years to live up to his advice, and uh, the verdict is still out. But uh, but I thought that was pretty good advice. Any any author ought to follow follow that advice. Uh, and I'm not sure I see him here. I don't know if Rafe is here. Rafe Sagalan is my agent, and I uh, uh, I wanted to make a point of thanking him because I have uh, for three books now he has helped me uh, uh, find the story that I was looking to tell and made it much better. And he's been a great agent and friend, so I want to thank him if he's here. Um, this, the question you often get on a, on, a, on a book like this is, why would you write it? And, <laughs> and particularly, uh, you know, uh, you get different ways of asking that question. If you, your more liberal friends say, why would you write it? <laughs> and your more conservative friends, some of them say, why would you write it as well? It's, 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 it was a, a phenomenally uh, uh, scarring tenure in American history, one that a lot of people have moved on from, would like to move on from. But the truth is, I don't think we really know about what happened under uh, Bush and Cheney until we go back to look at it. I think, in fact, uh, what we learned over time is that journalists get, at best, you know, 10, 20 percent of the story. Uh, we scratch the surface. And only afterwards, when uh, time and, and uh, resources are applied to going back and re-reporting these events, do we learn uh, what really happens behind closed doors. And I don't pretend this gets everything, but I, one of the things I think that was uh, gratifying in doing is how surprising the stories really are once you do take the time to go back and look at them. Um, a lot of people have focused on, for instance, the fact that uh, uh, this book talks about the relationship between President Bush and Vice President Cheney. I think that it, over time we had a fairly simplistic uh, uh, understanding of that. He was the, One was the puppet master, the other was the puppet, right? Uh, and, it made, and it made great copy for a lot of reporters and great fodder for a lot of late night comedians. Uh, but in fact, I think any serious understanding of that administration has to take a more three dimensional look at things. And in fact, it wasn't as, uh, as cartoonish or stick figure ish a kind of relationship uh, as it was often perceived. Now, many people in Washington know that, but uh, I think outside uh, of Washington in particular, that's, that's often surprising. Vice President Cheney was by, by almost certainly the most influential vice president uh, to that time. No question about that. He understood Washington in a way that, uh, that very few people did. He was given great latitude by President Bush in building a new administration, setting priorities, and guiding policies. But he wasn't really in charge. Anybody who actually spent time in that White House understood that as General uh, Dick Myers, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, put it, the real alpha male in the White House was, in fact, George W. Bush. Uh, even in the early years, there were moments when Cheney was pushing him to do things and Bush pushed back. And in the times when Cheney did, in fact, win the fights, and he did win most of the fights in the early days, uh, I think it's fair to say he was pushing on an open door. He was, he, was, uh, he was guiding Bush in a direction that Bush was already prepared or inclined to go. Uh, I interviewed 275 people for this book, 400 interviews total, and not one of them ever told me that Bush told them that Cheney made him do something he didn't want to do. But the relationship wasn't static. It didn't stay that way. While Cheney was influential at the beginning, the, the two began moving in different directions over time. As Iraq began to go bad, as the, we discovered there were no weapons there, as everybody had been told, as he moved to his second term, President Bush began pivoting away from some of the harder approaches that Cheney favored toward more diplomacy, toward more uh, rebuilding of, uh, relations with allies, uh, toward uh, uh, moderating on some level some of the policies that had been so controversial in his first term. Now, and some of this is under pressure from the courts, from Congress, from the news media. But also, I think part of his understanding was that if he was going to leave a le legacy that lasted beyond his term, he needed to do something to get away from uh, the unsustainable uh, versions of policies that he had in his first term. And Vice President Cheney saw that as sort of a betrayal of their shared common values at the beginning. He saw that as an unwise capitulation to public opinion or, 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 or uh, you know, a, a vain se uh, a quest for a legacy. Uh, and so the two began uh, splitting up on a lot of important issues. By the time they left office, they were on opposite sides of, of Iran, North Korea, Syria, Lebanon, Russia, climate change, gun rights, gay rights, the auto bailout, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, Harriet Myers, and other issues. And that all leads to the, sort of the finale of the administration, those final days, where the two of them had a, had a, had a really tense uh, and unprecedented in their relationship um, 
uh, quarrel over what to do about Scooter Libby. Scooter Libby, of course, you'll remember, was the vice president's chief of staff, national security advisor as well. He'd been convicted in the CIA leak case, not of the actual leak, but of perjury and obstruction of justice in the investigation. Vice President Cheney thought this was a, 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 a travesty. In his mind, it was a political investigation, one that actually, in his view, might have been targeting him, that is the vice president, and that Scooter Libby took the bullet, in effect, for him, uh, in his view, unfairly. And he goes to President Bush and says, this is something I want. This is the last thing, in effect, he's asking the president after their eight-year partnership. And the president's reluctant. He doesn't believe in pardons to begin with. He was one of the most conservative issuers of pardon in American history, uh, I think topped only by his father. Uh, and he saw the uh, pardon system as, as sort of corrupt by the fact that people with special access uh, were able to get pardons, and the average people out there who might have, might have deserved them also had no chance. So he was reluctant to begin with. And then he sent out the White House lawyers to reexamine the case, look at the files, look at the transcripts, and they even met with Scooter Libby in a uh, 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 seafood restaurant, McCormick and Schmick's, uh, just a couple blocks from the White House. And they came back to the president and they said, we think the jury had every reason to find what it found. In other words, there's not an, a case here of overwhelming you know, uh, injustice that you should, you should use your pardon for. And the president told Cheney no. Uh, and Cheney told him that he was leaving a good man wounded on the field of battle, probably the harshest thing he had ever said to the president. Uh, and that's the way their partnership ended. Literally in the last day of the Bush's presidency, he gets into the limousine with President-elect with President Obama to head to the Capitol for the inauguration. And the one thing he says to him in these last moments, literally the last minutes of his presidency, is get yourself a pardon policy. Stick to it from the beginning. He's thinking about his rift with his vice president even as he's about to leave office. So the, the, to me, I wrote the book because I think this uh, this frames these eight years uh, in almost Shakespearean terms. I think that it's, uh, it's, it's a powerful uh, uh, reminder that we, we don't fully understand what happens in a White House until uh, years later. This won't be the last uh, history of that White House, but I hope it will be at least a starting point for those who, who will come later. Uh, and um, uh, and I, had, uh, I had a lot of fun actually doing it, if you can believe that. <laughs> I was lucky enough to have... Uh, uh, time off from work. My, my bosses were very generous. Uh, and I enjoyed very much going back and interviewing people who either hadn't talked in the past or talked more freely. Uh, and people were very generous with their time uh, eventually. Now, President Bush did not choose to participate. Um, he was very uh, polite and gracious, but said he didn't believe that a New York Times reporter could be fair. And he also... <laughs> And he believed that, uh, that history won't be really able to judge him until long after he's gone. Uh, he's also done with politics, honestly. I mean, I think that part of it is, even if he, even if he liked me, uh, he's just done with politics. He went back to Texas. He had no more interest. He, he, he told visitors to Dallas uh, a, a little while ago that uh, when he saw Obama's hand go up on Inauguration Day, his thoughts, Bush's thoughts, were free at last, free at last, and he could go home. Uh, Vice President Cheney, on the other hand, um, uh, decided to, he was free as well, but he was free finally to, to say the things in public that he hadn't been saying much in the years before. And he became a sharp and, 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 and vocal critic of President Obama and his national security policies. Um, he, did, he did give me uh, uh, a couple, several interviews for the book, uh, and it was interesting talking to him, and I appreciate his time. And I w was able to, very fortunate to interview Don Rumsfeld a few times as well as Condi Rice, uh, Colin Powell, uh, Stephen Hadley, Mike Gerson, uh, Josh Bolton, a lot of the people, David Petraeus, a lot of the people who were central to that administration, as I said, 275 and all. And the thing that I was very gratified by, and this, this is the, the, the fortunate thing over the passage of time, people grow a little less nervous. 95% um, of the people, I would say, that, we, uh, that I interviewed eventually went on the record. Uh, not with necessarily everything they said, but with at least something that they said. And so they're all listed in the back. The footnotes uh, give you uh, a, a documentation of what's in the book, and, and we can, and then that will be again a, a fodder for, for future historians. So, um, I think at that point I'm just gonna. I, I, I'd love to have a conversation with everybody, and we can talk about uh, what interests you about the book, about Bush and Cheney, uh, about the New York Times, or anything else that I can uh, I can help with. Uh, we have two. Uh, Two microphones here, and and we are there are taping, so it's good to get to the microphone for the for the questions. So, 
sir. I'd like to ask you to step down from Bush and Cheney and look at several other characters, in particular Rumsfeld, <clears throat> um, and um, looking at the fact that it seemed to be that Cheney and Rumsfeld, from the very beginning with Wolfowitz, pushing for Iraq, Colin Powell, George Tenet, perhaps the uh, uh, FBI director, trying to hold that from happening. The irony of going to the United Nations and putting the two people that tried the hardest to keep us from going into Iraq, Colin Powell and George Tennant, sitting there making the case with Rumsfeld and Cheney on the other side. I'd just like to ask you whether that's a correct uh, view of what I personally saw. Mm -hmm. uh, did everybody hear the question about, it's, the question is about Rumsfeld and, 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 and on the one hand, Powell on the other, and, and, and the, 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 the clash in effect over going to, to war in Iraq. And I think you raise very, very good points. I think clearly Rumsfeld and Cheney were more interested, and Wolfowitz were more interested in taking on Iraq um, than certainly Colin Powell uh, and George Tenet. It, it's, it's interesting that I found in the research for this book, I found an oral history that Cheney gave in 2000, just months before Bush put him on the ticket, and it was sealed until after his vice presidency was over, so nobody had ever seen it before. Uh, and he's asked about the Gulf War and why they didn't go all the way to Baghdad, and what did he think of that decision then? And in 2000, just literally about a year or so before 9-11, uh, he said it was the wrong decision to go to Baghdad. It would have been wrong to go. They would have, you know, he, he maintained the same position that he had taken and that President Bush 41 had taken, that it would have gotten them in a quagmire and that it would have, they would have owned a country in effect that they didn't want to own. So it really tells you that 9-11 shaped that decision making beyond uh, where it had been even a year earlier. And Rumsfeld was intent on, on, on Iraq on 9-11. On, on he talks with some of his aides in the Pentagon just hours after it's hit by uh, by one of the planes, he says, you know, we should think about going after Saddam Hussein at the same time we go after bin Laden. But Bush was there, too. I mean, it, you know, this was not them pushing him to do something he wouldn't have done otherwise. He raises with Rumsfeld uh, just a few weeks after 9-11 uh, the idea of going back and looking at the war plan and getting ready to uh, think about what they're going to do with Iraq. Uh, and, and, and I think it's also important to remember about Powell that he... I think felt very scarred by the UN presentation of what turned out to be false uh, intelligence, but he never actually told the president, don't do it. What he tried to do was slow it down. He tried to, to, to move it to the UN. He tried to find diplomatic uh, exit ramps, as it were. But when push came to shove, the president went to him and say, okay, I'm ready to go. Are you with me? And he says, yes, sir, I am. Now, uh, that was a controversial decision even in his circle. Richard Armitage, who was his deputy chief, uh, deputy uh, secretary of state, at one point, I think this is in the book, and I'll, I don't know if it's been around before, but he urges him to resign because he says the other guys are using you as a shield to build credibility for decisions that you don't really like. Um, and he refuses. Powell refuses, I think, out of the, the, the good soldier nature of his, uh, his view toward public service. But it's, I think he's got an interesting place in this because he, uh, he, did, he never did say no. He never did oppose the war. And even, he, you know, even today, I think he'll admit that when, he, when you talk to him. Uh, but he did try to raise objections. He did try to raise concerns that, uh, that ultimately were overlooked. Sorry. It's wonderful to see you. I've never seen you in person. I see you all the time on television uh, on Friday night. Do you think... Shorter in public, right? <laughs> Not for me to say. <laughs> I had a woman come up to me on the street one day. She looked up at me. She didn't say hello. She didn't say, are you so-and-so. She looked at me and she says, you look much more tired off television. <laughs> <laughs> do you think Bush was surprised by the results in Iraq? And do you think he was naive going in? I should say that um, my generation is the Vietnam generation. I graduated from college in 1969. And Bush never had to worry about going to war, whereas all my friends did. I mean, the draft was there, and, and, and so they all watched television compulsively every night to see how things were going, because by 68 and 69, they were going really badly. And I've always wondered if Bush had, had, if Bush had been under serious threat of the draft, if he would have paid more attention. So was he surprised when what, what he was told was so easy uh, turned out to be more difficult? And of course, he would never say that you know he'd made a mistake going in, but do you think he had 
uh, some buyer's remorse? Yeah, that's a great question. You heard the question. Did Bush have buyers? Did Bush have buyer's remorse about Iraq? Did he? Uh, did he? Uh, he didn't face the draft himself. Uh, was he surprised by how badly things went in Iraq? And did he have buyer's remorse? I think he was surprised by how badly things went. Absolutely. I think they totally misjudged what was going to happen. I think they would admit that today. I think they thought this was going to be a uh, easy as not what they necessarily thought, but they did say, you know, uh, uh, shock and awe, and they had this right. idea that, that they would have a uh, relatively clean and relatively fast uh, uh, victory there. In fact, the, the plans were to withdraw a lot of troops by the fall of 2003. They, they didn't anticipate a long, uh, a long uh, uh, occupation there. So, uh, but when he, if you ask him today, I, I, he would tell you, no, he doesn't regret sending them in. Now, maybe you have to think that. I don't know. Maybe he does think that and won't tell us. Maybe you know, he feels history won't allow him to have second thoughts. But he's not a Robert McNamara. I don't think he stays up nights um, agonizing. agonizing over this. In fact, he makes a point of saying, I don't do that. I don't believe in LBJ-style leadership. And that's the way he would, he would put it. He does, I think, have certain regrets that he has expressed about the way they did it. They didn't send enough troops. They didn't do enough post-war planning. planning uh, and they didn't fully understand, obviously, the nature of the sectarian uh, conflicts that were that were there to be unleashed by the uh, the invasion so thank you well my <clears throat> my basic question is uh did you find uh, learn anything unexpected in your post uh post uh, vice presidency interviews of with dick cheney uh, one uh, addition, sort of subsidiary question arising from your answer to the first uh, thing, uh, first question, uh, you, you uh, indicate that you feel Cheney changed his views after 9-11. Do you think he really, really thought there was a connection? I know he said it all the time, but it's just hard for me to believe that anyone with any intelligence could believe there was a connection between 9-11 right. and Saddam Hussein. Right, right, right. And the question is, did I actually learn anything from the interviews with Vice President Cheney? And did he really think that there had been a, a connection between 9-11 and Iraq. Um, I did learn things from him. I thought it was interesting to talk to him. I was, I was interested. I asked him one question about the, the issue of waterboarding and the interrogation, right? And his point of view, I get his point of view. His point of view is, it's the ticking time bomb theory, right? If the country is genuinely facing an existential threat, which is what he's arguing, right? That not just box cutters, but genuinely, you know, much more cataclysmic type of attacks are potentially possible, then in his mind, you know, making a guy uh, suffer who's not a good guy didn't seem like that big a cost, that big a trade-off. But I asked him, I said, if you believe that intellectually, even if you think that's completely correct intellectually, was there any part of you that felt queasy about it? Because yeah, I can understand that, right? I mean, a lot of these issues are, are, are not always 100-0. A lot of these issues are 50-50, 70-30, whatever. And I would imagine that if I made a hard decision like that, there would still be a part of me that felt like, mm, you know, this isn't something I'm really how that comfortable with. And he said flatly, no, not at all. He had no uh, second guessing whatsoever, no sense of, of, of um, uh, hesitation or queasiness about it. And that's just the way he is. He, you know, and he makes his decisions. He sticks to them and he doesn't, he doesn't entertain, you know, uh, uh, you know, a lot of second guessing in his, in his own mind, even, or at least, at least admit it out loud. Uh, but as for 9-11, yeah, it's a good question. He hung on to that theory a lot longer than the intel guys would tell you it was a legitimate theory. And I, and I think that, um, uh, you know, there was that Mohammed Atta story meeting in Prague with an Iraqi agent that was fairly uh, well discredited uh, early on. And, and he, 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 he stuck with that for a long time, as did some of the people around him. And their view was that uh, the intelligence guys were uh, being political in trying to deny it and that they're not looking enough at the connections. That, that comes in part from the Gulf War, when he had been defense secretary. After the Gulf War was over, uh, people came into his office and they said, well, we, it turns out that our intel on Saddam Hussein from the Gulf War is wrong. He was much more advanced in his weapons programs than we had known. And I think that stuck with Cheney. I think that stuck with the idea that intel was too cautious and that you needed to be more daring in your linkages. Okay, Now, obviously, that turned out to be a mistake because there weren't the weapons there, but that was the thinking that was going into it at that time. So I think that he was willing to make leaps forward uh, on the theory that uh, we had been wrong in the other direction in the past. 
So. Thank you. Sir, over here. Uh, one of the tragedies of the war in Iraq was the uh, uh, post-military uh, gaffes that were made by diplomacy and by uh, the uh, military. Uh, would you discuss that? So the 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 post the gaffes meaning, give me give me. Uh, they, uh, I think you would agree that there were a number of actions that were taken, including putting the um, the uh, uh, Sunni military out of the picture. Yeah. Uh, 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 those. Those made for the tragedy of the war as yeah. much as the military did, uh, and surely uh, uh, Cheney and uh, Bush had uh, a lot of say in that. Yeah, and it's interesting. I think that there had been uh, it was, the question is about some of the decisions made after Saddam Hussein fell that uh, that might have helped propel the war and unleash some of the uh, sectarian violence. And I and I think those are huge debates today. And uh, I think the, the larger consensus uh, is that the, the, the two orders that Jerry Bremer issued, uh, and, 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 and Brad knows this much better than I do, but Jerry Bremer issued two orders after becoming the administrator in Iraq, one disbanding the army and the other uh, uh, the debathification order uh, uh, banning people who had been members of the Path Party above a certain level from holding uh, any kind of public job. Uh, those are widely regarded today as, as mistakes that, that propelled the insurgency um, if you listen to Jerry Bremer and his people, they have a counter argument to that. Their argument was that the, the army didn't exist anyway, so disbanding it was not exactly, uh, it was simply matching reality. Um, but uh, in any case, what was interesting about that to me was how hands off President Bush was about those decisions. He allowed them to be made. In fact, he had previously, in March of 03, he had basically signed off on a different approach to Iraq, a faster occupation and more of an in and out kind of thing. But Jerry Bremer came to him and said, I think we need to be there for a while. I think we need to be there for a while. We've got to do these actions that were just talked about. And Bush basically has this view of governance in which he deferred or de delegated to the people under him. And he didn't substitute his own judgment for those things. And he allowed them to make these decisions. And it's he doesn't change that approach until the end of 2006, when he finally decides we're going to move on from Secretary Rumsfeld and we're going to have this surge, even though... Everybody tells me against it. He until then he really deferred quite a lot to the generals, to the, to, to 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 Jerry Bremer, to some extent to to, to Vice President Cheney and Secretary Rumsfeld. Uh, and it takes him several years until he finally decides that it, the, the notion of deference, which comes from his LBJ idea of LBJ being too micromanaging on the war, it, only at that point does he kind of come around to a different way of uh, approaching it. And it, it, you see Cheney in it. I mean, Cheney's there, absolutely. He's, he, he, what Cheney wanted, obviously, was uh, a quick government put in of some of these exiles, the Ahmad Chalabi types. What Cheney would tell you is he didn't really know Ahmad Chalabi all that well. It didn't really matter to him what exile went in there. That may be post facto. I, I, don't, I, I can't say for sure. But they had a very different view of, of where that went. And when Bremer came back in the fall of 2003 with this sort of longer occupation plan, Cheney and Powell actually agreed at that point that they didn't like that plan, that they needed to find a way of turning uh, autonomy back over to the Iraqis in a sooner, uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a faster basis. But in the end, it, you know, a lot of these things may or may not have mattered because what what was underlying uh, the conflict, the, 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 this clash between the Sunnis and, and Shiites that had been tamped down by the repressive regime of Saddam Hussein for so many years, once that Pandora's box was lifted, uh, it, it may be that those were sort of, uh, you know, unavoidably uh, uh, um, explosive uh, uh, trends. So. Hi. Would you try to compare uh, Cheney uh, and Bush versus Kissinger and Nixon? <laughs> the question is, uh, do you com can you compare Bush and Cheney with uh, uh, Kissinger and Nixon? And there, I make a slight comparison to them in the book, in, in, only in that I think that their partnership, Bush and Cheney's partnership, is the most interesting and consequential in American politics uh, of pol office holders, anyway, since Nixon and Kissinger. And I and I I, I love Robert Dalek's book on uh, uh, on Nixon and Kissinger. I think the difference is uh, the similarity in that they are obviously two powerful people who are who are joining together to 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 reshape the world, really. Uh, and um, and we're we're uh, you know 
pushed off criticism and 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 uh, and became hugely controversial at home and abroad. The difference is though, if you go back and read Dalek's book or you, or you listen to some of these tapes, I mean, there is a significant difference. I mean, Kissinger and Nixon uh, approached a certain level of cynicism as reflected by another new book this fall that you might get called Blood Telegram by a friend of ours, Gary Bass. It's about Nixon and Kissinger and the genocide in um, Bangladesh in 1971 and, the, and the, the tapes that he unearthed, the the deep cynicism and malevolence uh, in the Oval Office about hundreds of thousands of people dying in, in Bangladesh is really quite striking. And we don't have any evidence of anything like that in this partnership. Maybe someday we'll, 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 we'll see more that I, that I don't know about at this point. But, uh, but I think there's, you know, I think on some level there's some comparison, but, um, um, but I would want to be careful about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, actually, the, the gentleman on the left, uh, your response to the gentleman on the left um, touched on what my question was going to be. But what was your final take on Jerry Bremer? Mm. I mean, he was a State Department guy. Who was he taking orders from? Presumably, he was taking orders. He was, but he, uh, but he, he, he very quickly, President Bush made clear that Bremer was his guy. Right. And he did so by having him to private lunch in the White House. They worked out in the White House gym. And that sent a message saying that Bremer, in effect, reported to uh, President Bush. And that turned off Rumsfeld, actually. That became actually a point of great contention for Rumsfeld. He felt he felt this was wrong. It was bad for the chain of command to have somebody who, in theory, was reporting to him, the secretary, also reporting to the president. And it encouraged him, I think, and, and again, Brad can tell you more about this than I can, but I think it encouraged him to kind of wipe his hands a little bit of what was going on there. He became so disenchanted with the idea that he was being circumvented that at a certain point he finally, you know, the, the, he and Condi Rice are going down the stairs in the White House at one point, and Condi says to him, hey, you should tell Jerry to do such and such. And he says, well, you tell him. He reports to you, not me. And that, 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 that contributed to a dysfunction that I don't think the, I don't think the president intended, but uh, uh, drew further uh, wedges within his team uh, because he was perceived as answering to the president. And because the president was so deferential to people under him, it gave uh, Bremer a fairly free hand. Uh, there was a lot of talk, if you remember, both uh, comic and straight, about how dumb George Bush was supposed to be. Yeah. Uh, what's the truth of this? Could you comment on this? Is there any truth in it, comic or otherwise? Right. <laughs> the question is, uh, is, is Bush really, uh, uh, is he not very smart? <laughs> um, and, you know, I, the truth is, I think, I think that's a kind of a... a I think that's a stereotype, but I think I think he encouraged it. You know, I think he has no one to blame but himself to some extent, right? He went to Andover, Yale, Harvard. He's not a dumb guy. He's a smart guy. He's not a uh, he's not a bookish fella, even though I think he does read books. He's not a he's anti intellectual in his character and his presentation. And I think because he goes out there and makes it a point of 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 showcasing his sort of anti intellectual popularist populist kind of. Uh, you know, uh, demeanor encouraged this notion that he wasn't very bright. He also obviously suffered from an articulation issue that didn't help, right? Is our children learning and issues like that certainly gave the impression of somebody who, who wasn't necessarily as, as, uh, um, as, as bright as, in fact, I think he actually was. You know, one of his aides told me uh, how they were distra distressed every time he would go out in front of a camera because the person that they would see uh, in the Oval Office, being you know smart, engaged, uh, you know articulate, became you know so unimpressive uh, when the cameras were rolling, and that they even one of them told me that that she thought that actually he was kind of even a little afraid of cameras, which is kind of interesting given that he grew up in politics. Uh, and a lot of Democrats would tell you, and they would go into the, some of these meetings, they were surprised, they would walk out surprised uh, at that he was smart and he, he seemed uh, much more engaged and on top of things, he wasn't especially curious. He didn't, you know, he didn't have sort of Clinton's kind of ranging kind of uh, intellect. Clinton put things together uh, in ways other people wouldn't do. Uh, he doesn't have Obama's sort of lawyerly kind of drill down approach. Uh, but I think it's not right to say he's not smart. Oh, <laughs> okay. Peter, here comes the tough. One. <clears throat> no, not at all, Peter. I wanted to thank you actually. Um, I may change my mind, I'm only a couple of chapters in, <laughs> but from what I've read, it is the first book coming out on the Bush administration, which is historical in its sensibility and not polemical or political. And 
you said two things with which I disagree, with which I agree. Only one thing that I could, in your remarks, that I disagreed with. Um, I agree certainly that the experience of 9-11 influenced Vice President Cheney's thinking very profoundly. My own sense, my own experience in the White House then was that he felt it happened on his watch and he would never let that happen again to the American people. To explain is not to explain away right. or excuse some of the right. bad decisions made, but I think they were made for real reasons, not cynical ones, and I think you're, you're absolutely right. Second thing you said I agree with is that there was a conscious decision in the second term to repair things. Mm -hmm. um, the analogy was, Condi Rice once made the analogy that we were like Bismarck. We built, we, did, we broke a lot of China in the mid 19th century, but after that, Bismarck becomes an element of stability. Right. He wants to be friends with all of Germany's neighbors. And is, he gets fired, fights not followed, <laughs> the rest is history, right? That analogy we used um, explicitly. It's time to rebuild, turn to allies, get rid of the um, sense of righteousness because you're fighting with everybody. Uh, and it was a much more productive period. I think that's right. The only, th since the only thing you said that I disagreed with was a small thing. You said there was a difference in outlook on Russia between Bush and Cheney. Presumably you think that Cheney was harder line. And certainly Cheney gave a very couple of tough speeches about the Russians. But I th think Bush... Bush is known for, you know, looking into Putin's soul, right? What he said in, in their first meeting right. in Slovenia in, in June 01. But what's not known, and it may be in your book, but I don't think so, <laughs> is that um, he got the measure of uh, he got the measure of Putin or what he thought Putin was um, much earlier than is known. Yeah. And you know, by 03, 04, I think he understood. Um, yeah, he had a very different sense who he was dealing with. Right. But Peter, I just wanted to thank you. It's 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 something to to pull yourself away from the the journalistic and go to the historical. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Know? you. I appreciate that. Okay. This, by the way, is Dan Fried, who has served both administrations, the Bush administration and the Obama administration, loyally. And he's uh, he's a, he's a he's his name is Dan Fried. Uh, he worked in he worked in uh, in this administration. He worked in the last administration. He's a he's a public servant. Uh, uh, you know, who, who's given his life to his, his country. So I think uh, we should be appreciative of that. And not many people can say they worked in both the Bush administration and the Obama administration. And, 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 Clinton. and Clinton administration. Uh, and I appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. I, uh, I, I, I agree with that. Actually, there's some more about Putin in there. You should look in the book. You'll find some stuff you'll like. Um, as you know, uh, Ambassador Pickering and others have just led a bipartisan blue ribbon commission on detainee policy, and the conclusions are pretty damning. So my question is, um, number one, do you think Bush or Cheney will ever read this report? And number two, do you think that there's any possibility that they would do any backtracking at all on things like black sites and rendition? I mean, I understand the, the, the Cheney torture piece, but is there any backwards movement on sort of the entire detainee yeah, Probably. this is my planted question, by the way, for very, my very good friend. Thank you for coming. The boy's mother right here. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, I think there was backwards uh, 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 changes by Bush. Uh, Cheney believes strongly that they did the right thing. He says that the evidence is that we didn't get attacked by the end. And he feels, as I think, as Dan said, I think he felt very strongly. You can, t you can tell us today that he was wrong. But I think he felt very strongly, very genuinely that the country was at great risk uh, and that, that, that the niceties that other people were worried about were not going to stop him from doing what he thought was necessary uh, to, uh, to protect the country. And there were trade-offs. And that's what the Pickering uh, report talks about. The, the trade-offs, obviously, were 
important, and they're ones that we as a country have debated. Where, what you know, what does it mean to be America? What where, what are the limits we're willing to put on ourselves? What are we, you know, where are we going to 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 avoid being like the guys we're fighting? And those are questions I think that Bush grappled with in the second term. Uh, and he doesn't get a lot of attention for that because he himself doesn't want to admit, I think, that he made changes. And he doesn't want to admit that anything was necessarily wrong about the first term. But if you look at the policies, they change drastically. He, 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 there's no waterboarding after 2003. Uh, he, uh, he actually closes the CIA black site prisons. Now, again, all this happens under pressure. I'm not saying he does it out of the you know, goodness of his heart, per se. I think he, he came to realize that society was not behind him on some of these things and that, the, that the, 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 the risk or danger that he saw in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 did ease over time and that they no longer needed, in his view, what he would say is they no longer needed some of the more extreme things that they did because they had put other things in place to make the country safer uh, by the time that the second term rolls around and they no longer needed to take the most you know, drastic measures. Um, that may be self-justification. You know, it'll be a debate we have for a long time. But it is interesting if you look back at history, almost every wartime president has taken us further than we have been comfortable going. And then the system kind of writes itself. Adams with the uh, Alien and Sedition Act, uh, Lincoln with the uh, you know, suspending habeas corpus, uh, Wilson, you know, he, he, he jailed his, uh, one of his challengers uh, from the election, Eugene Debs. I mean, FDR obviously interred uh, the Japanese Americans. So, and after each of these episodes, when, when the immediate danger and the immediate um, atmosphere that the danger creates has dissipated, the country goes back and says to the courts or Congress or whatever and says, wait a second, that's too far. We're not going to go there. And Bush, in effect, started that process by going to Congress on detention, going to Congress on military commissions, going to Congress on surveillance. Uh, and Obama then inherited – Obama ran against Bush's first term, but he inherited Bush's second term so that by the time he comes in office – He's not really changing things 180 degrees. He's making modified changes, but he's adopting a lot of what Bush uh, left behind. Again, to, to some criticism by a lot of people who think he's betrayed what he ought to have done. But, you, you, but it's because Bush had made that change in the second term that Obama uh, felt comfortable keeping at least uh, the large part of it intact. Oh, sorry. Over here. Peter, it's a pleasure to, to, to come to this and ask you a question. Really enjoy your work in the New York Times. Really Thank enjoying you. reading the book. Thank you. Um, in your conversations with Vice President Cheney, Tell us about that. I mean, tell us about the interactions. Was he intimidating? Was he sort of the cartoonish <laughs> person we sort of think of? Yeah. Or um, was he something completely different? And also, um, when he would go off the record, when he would go on background, were you challenged as a, you know, as a reporter to try to find that from another source? Did you, I mean, was it sort of like, oh, my gosh, Dick Cheney wants to go off the record. I'm going to make sure it stays <laughs> off the record. Or did you try to find it? With another you know, it's very interesting. He's uh, I did not do a lot of interviews with him when I covered him for the newspaper. He didn't like the uh, uh, well, he didn't like the New York Times, especially. Um, and he didn't always like the Washington Post. Uh, and so I don't I never got a lot of interviews. In fact, I'm trying to think if I ever interviewed him when he was in office. I'm not sure I did. So I was a little surprised that he agreed to do it. Uh, and I was I, I made the case to him that, you know, the book was intended to be fair, not it's not pro. It's not con. Uh, uh, it's the, uh, it's meant to just be a, you know, a fair rendition. And if you want to, you know, have your say in it, this is the chance to do it. And he, and he just took me up on it and I was grateful for that. He, um, I met him in his house in McLean a couple times. Uh, his daughter Liz was with him. Uh, she supervised, uh, <laughs> and, um, he was, this was the pre transplant days. So he was, uh, he had that pump that he had this, uh, it's a, it, what he had was a battery. It was attached to a device that was inside him that was uh, keeping him alive. And this device is actually not meant to be a permanent solution. It's meant to be a temporary thing until they find a heart. Well, he went 20 months with this pump, which is unusual. So he seemed a little, um, uh, he, was, he was definitely, uh, uh, he, his weight is down. Uh, he didn't have clearly much energy at that time, uh, but he was in good spirits and he had a, you know, um, he gave me a lot of time without being rushed. Um, he's a very, as you've seen on, on television, he's a very low-key, um, unbombastic type of fellow, right? He represents policies that are often, you know, uh, lead to kind of a certain, um, whatever the right word is, <laughs> I'll have to think about that word, by others, right? But he's not New Gingrich in that sense. He's a very, you know, smart, thoughtful. He explains his positions in a, uh, in a, in a logical way. You sit there and listen to him and think, okay, I see that. 
Uh, he, he doesn't, um, he, I don't think in any of these interviews I did with him, um, you know, he, he, you know, he admitted that other people disagree with him. I mean, he's, he didn't, he didn't argue with that. He says, people are free to have a different point of view. This is why I had it. He's very sort of matter of fact, the way he presents it. And he was matter of fact about his disagreements with Bush, which I was struck by. He didn't try to shade it over. Uh, he says, look, you know, I disagree with him. He, uh, he went a different direction. I think I was, and he said openly, I thought I was more influential in the first term. I wasn't so much in the second term. Uh, and here's what I think about that. And again, he wasn't harsh in any way, although obviously it must have been something he felt strongly. Um, but, um, but those were inter interesting interviews. Did um, he go off the record a lot, or was he all on the record? Well, the, 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 the interviews we did were on background. Okay. And by background, and that's often meant but different people mean different things. The background meant that I could use it without citing him as a source, but the understanding was that I could come back to him and, and, and ask him to be on the record. So I went back to him with a pages and pages and pages of, of quotes and things I wanted to put on the record. And you know what? He got back to me and he approved every single one. No changes. Didn't argue with a single one. So, you know, I was happy about that. That's not often the case. A lot of times when you do that kind of reporting, people try to edit or nitpick or, you know, really, you know, I don't like this or this. He was just straightforward. Yeah, that's all fine. That's what I said. That's what I believe. And I, uh, you know, as a writer, you appreciate that. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, Thank you. Just a quick question, I guess, to get your impressions on an impression that I have. With regard to the Saudi royal family, mm. both Bush and Cheney seem to have longstanding, deep relationships with the king, and Prince Bandar was a presence in the White right. House and around town. And what effect do you think that relationship had on Iraq policy? And did it change between Bush and Cheney over time or between the first and second term? That's a very good question. The question is about the relationship between Bush and Cheney and the Saudi uh, uh, royal family, and that there had been a lot of history there, particularly from the uh, first Gulf War. You know, in fact, in this one, uh, when uh, uh, in January of 2003, Cheney grabs Rumsfeld, says, come with me, we're going to go see Prince Bandar, who was the Saudi ambassador in Washington, a very well-known figure in Washington, kind of a, a little bit of a bon vivant, very, you know, flamboyant for a, for a, for a Saudi. Um, and he went to him and told him the president's made a decision, Saddam is toast. Uh, and Bandar didn't believe him because he, he thought, you know, well, you guys didn't do this last time. Why would I believe you this time? He says, this time he is toast. Uh, and Rumsfeld was actually surprised by this because he hadn't heard the president had made a decision as early as January of 2003. Uh, and so what we don't know for sure is did the Cheney actually get that from Bush or was Cheney simply channeling what he thought was going to happen, what he thought he could help make happen? Um, and it's not really clear. But the, strain, the, 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 the relationship actually becomes strained. Uh, the Saudis don't have the same relationship with this White House that they did with the first White House, and in fact become quite frustrated by it, uh, uh, partly because Bush 43 is so much more overtly pro-Israel than, say, Bush 41, and the Saudis become very frustrated that he isn't doing more to push uh, the Israelis to ease up on the Palestinians, to, to, to enter peace talks or what have you. And there are, in fact, moments where the Saudis are ready to break with him. There's an interesting scene in there about going down to Crawford and the, and the Saudi uh, crown prince is just is going to stage a walkout because he's so upset with Bush. So, you know, the relationship was complicated and not as simple as it was, I, I think, in the past. And then you lead into today where they're very frustrated with President Obama. Thank and, you. Brad, we got one more. Can we do one more? Yeah, well, I, I have one, too. Oh, your question? Okay. All right. <laughs> I thought you were cutting us off. Okay. He's got one. So. All right. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not up here to uh, call a halt okay. to this. Cause this Brad's this here is, for rebuttal. He's going to tell this me. This is uh, too interesting. He's going to tell me where I got it wrong. But, um, you know, um, no. I'm sure you'll agree that as a reporter, going back and writing a book about events that you covered in real time can be a, a very humbling experience. And I'm not going to ask you to, to grade yourself. <laughs> on your coverage of Bush's second term. But uh, my question is, how has the experience of doing this book influenced now how you're covering the current administration? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. How is the, the question, if everybody didn't get it, is how did doing the book influence how you think about covering a White House now, this one, for instance? And I think what I get out of it is um, uh, when they tell you something's not true, it almost always is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a White House almost institutionally, it doesn't matter, Republican, Democrat, Obama, Bush, a White House is absolutely programmed to deny almost any story you're going to write. <laughs> <laughs> 
and that where you think you have a small clue as to the divisions or the debate or this policy or that policy, and they're saying, no, you got it all wrong. And later you learn, oh, you had it exactly right. <laughs> In fact, what you didn't have right was you didn't know how far uh, it was. And, and so that's, I keep that in mind now when I, when I listen to a White House tell me that I'm all off, and maybe I am, but um, I'm, I'm very, um, I, I keep a grain of salt in, uh, uh, in the back of my mind, realizing that someday we're going to get a fuller story and, and hope the ones I write today are at least uh, not embarrassing <laughs> when the fuller ones are told. So. All right, two, two short questions, if I might. First, in your research, I've always wondered the origin of the order on September 11th to shoot down aircraft, mm -hmm. whether it was Cheney by himself, Cheney with Bush, Bush to Cheney, where that came from, if you know. And second, in terms of the interest in Bush's intelligence, uh, I was told by two senior domestic policy people who briefed Bush fairly regularly that he was the only politician they ever briefed who would actually stop them and say, you lost me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not following you. Give me an example or go back over that. And right. He felt comfortable enough in his skin to, to do that. Right. And right. I wonder if you came across that. That's a good question. So the question, the two questions, one is uh, who actually gave the shoot down order on 9-11? Was it Bush or Cheney? And the second one was an observation that people that w he had talked to who briefed Bush, he was willing to do what a lot of politicians are not and say, look, you lost me. Please help me understand what you're saying here. And I think they're both good. One's a good question. One's a good observation. The question of who gave the shoot down order on 9-11 is, is unsolved. And I think it's one of these things that will continue to be a source of mystery going for years. The, the question is, the vice president, of course, is in the bunker, right? And the question comes up, what do we do if there are more hijacked planes out there? And they scramble jets, in theory, to shoot them down if they have to. And the vice president is told by an aide who comes into the situation room, there's a plane X miles away. Do we have permission to shoot it down? And he says, yes. And the, the guy comes back a second time and says, well, sir, the plane is now, you know, 40. I'm make, I'm, I don't remember the details, so I'm going to get some. The plane is now 40 miles away instead of 60 miles away. Do we have permission to shoot it down? And he says, yes. And they come back a third time and says, well, sir, do we, it's now 20 miles away. Do we have permission to shoot it down? And he says, yes. Did I tell you? I mean, he's really upset, actually, that the guy kept coming back. But it was such a momentous decision. And, and Cheney was so calm about it. Uh, Scooter Libby actually said that Cheney made this decision in the time it takes a batter to swing at a strike, uh, to swing at a ball. You know I mean? It was just instantaneous. And I asked him about this, by the way, in the interview. I said, what was that like to order what could have been the deaths of hundreds of Americans, innocent Americans? And he says, I didn't even, you know, it, it was, it's, I don't want to sound callous, he said, uh, but it was an easy decision to make because in his mind, it was a very straightforward trade-off. You know, hundreds of innocents dying or thousands of innocents dying. And in that case, he felt like there wasn't really much of an option. So, but it's interesting that he can make that calculation so cleanly in his mind. I know I couldn't. Uh, now the question is, did he have permission from Bush to do this when he did it? Both he and Bush say yes. Both he and Bush say there was a phone call that took place before the vice president gives this order in which Bush explicitly gives him authorization to convey this order uh, if necessary. But the problem is that the 9-11 Commission went and looked, and they looked for logs and notes that were taken by people, and they can't find a record of this call. So that adds some suspicion. Does, it, does this really happen? Now, some people say, look, in the fog of the moment, you know, uh, you can't trust all of these, uh, you know, fa fallible memories and fallible uh, records and, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, and Connie Rice, for instance, who says she heard him say it and so forth. So there, are, there is some testimony uh, that, in fact, it happened the way they say it happened. Bush gave the order first. It's interesting because if he hadn't, I'm not sure that many people would question necessarily um, the exigency of the moment, right? I mean, if, in fact, you think a, a plane is heading to the White House, uh, is anybody really going to quibble with the, the vice president at that point saying, you know, shoot it down? But... Um, Josh Bolton, who was a chief of staff later and at the time was uh, a domestic, uh, uh, I was, I think, uh, deputy chief of staff, um, asked the vice president, well, maybe we should confirm this with the president because he hadn't heard the earlier phone call. And I asked him about that. He said, well, it's not that I doubted that he had talked to him, but I did think that we should make sure to talk to the president and let him know this order had been given. So I think that's one of the, that'll be one of the enduring questions about the administration. And I think your other point, I'll just leave it. I think you're right. I think he did know enough to, and did feel comfortable enough in his own skin to say, I don't get it. He didn't read briefing books the way other 
presidents necessarily do. He liked one or two pages. He preferred oral briefings. That's how he learned. People learn different ways. Clinton uh, uh, liked written and oral. Uh, Obama really prefers written. He doesn't particularly uh, care as much for the oral. When, when Obama is given a, br a, a briefing, somebody says something that's in the paper. He says, well, I already know that. I've already read the paper. Tell me something that's not in the paper. So it, each of them, I think, gets information in different ways. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. You're the last. Uh, given the hostility to the New York Times and the Washington Post, why did Cheney, when he was decide to out Valerie Plain, why do you want Libby or whoever to work with a reporter from either the Post or the Times instead of going out to say a conservative publication? Right. Well, that's a good question. Why would why would somebody like Cheney, who distrusted the New York Times and the Washington Post, deal with reporters from there? I think he had relationships with individual reporters that he trusted that he thought were fair or going to listen to him or, or what have you. Um, uh, you know, Cheney is a sophisticated uh, uh, person in Washington. He understands that reporters are not all the same. Um, there are some that maybe wouldn't be as, uh, you know, uh, open to, to, to what he might want to tell him and some who, who would. So I, I think he understood that, um, um, uh, that putting something out through a concerned publication would automatically, you know, uh, maybe uh, raise questions about his credibility or, or, or you know, and then having something out in the New York Times uh, probably is a different message in terms of uh, what the public might think about it. And he, he was a pretty sophisticated consumer of, uh, of, of information in the media. So, okay. Well, thank you guys very much. Appreciate your coming. Very kind of you. It's a great event. Thank you, Brad.